Sniper Elite had it all. The fame, the fortune, the success. It took some chances and they paid off big. Its Italian fling got a slug to the dome, but having watched Under the Tuscan Sun on the plane ride over, it knew the risks. Sure, it already found its apex. Sure, it just had to recreate who it was literally a second time. But where's the fun in that? It's not Sniper Average. It was Sniper Elite. It doesn't take orders, it gives them. It is a wolf among sheep, and it is hungry. It can do no wrong. Right? In March 2019, Rebellion confirmed that work had begun on Sniper Elite 5, throwing at least a handful of fans into a tizzy. Maybe even a dozen. The maps would be generated using photogrammetry and be some of the largest and most immersive yet. At what was surely the event of 2021, the Game Awards, fans got a glimpse of Sniper Elite 5 for the first time. And after dropping in May 2022, it caused a schism in the Sniper Elite community. Those who thought the new thing was cool, and those that thought the new thing was not as good as the old thing. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down a few of the arguments claimed by both sides to figure out, is Sniper Elite 5 worth playing? Well, before I can answer that, just know this video is going to feel like a roast at times, even though the video, it's not an autopsy. I don't make videos for games that I hate, so I don't want to give you the wrong impression. It's just as I was reviewing my footage and writing this script, I had to pause like every 30 seconds to write something down, and not in a good way. I think my analysis reflects that. Also, I won't be including any of the DLC in this review, as I believe the base game itself should be assessed on its own merits, and also because we're close enough to all the DLC being released that I'd rather wait and cover it all in a separate video. With that being said, there are massive spoilers ahead. You've been warned. Acknowledge you've been warned by subscribing. Please. So you must be asking yourself, especially if you come here from another video in my Sniper Elite retrospective, what exactly has changed this time around? Well, we've got the inclusion of tools you need to find around the map to complete certain objectives. There are one-offs like poison and rat bombs, but the main three are bolt cutters, a crowbar, and a satchel charge. Because yes, these don't magically appear when you want to use them now. Within each map, we also have the ability to find new insertion points, which besides being a great spot for writing me to have put a joke, don't know what I was thinking there, these are optional starting locations you can use to change up the flow of your game or help cut down on excess map crossing when mopping up achievements and collectibles. After each level, you get a little magic quadrant that will tell you how lethal you were, how great of a guy you are, and this is an important factor to include, since Sniper Elite now has non-lethal ammo. AI, while having a few new tricks, largely feels like it's gotten a downgrade. If you shoot an enemy in the arm, they'll drop it and switch to their sidearm. A neat little addition adds some life to these bundles of polygons, but that's about as much life as you're gonna see. And despite the new tools at our disposal all related to attracting attention, like this helmet on a stick that's supposed to tag enemies, and the non-lethal excuse for an anti-personnel mine that sparkles and plugs in your iPod, I gave up on trying to lure any enemies into traps. For those that are interested in not only trying to lure or trap an enemy, but even outmaneuvering them, there's also this spidey sense slash eagle vision ability that Carl has now that'll let him see enemies through walls. This really doesn't bug me at all. It sucks in some gameplay modes, that I'll cover, but from a realism standpoint, it's introduced in a cool way where Carl realizes he can see and hear an enemy through a hole in the wall. I chalked it up to the video game version of how all our senses work together in real life to inform us of certain facts. Sniper Elite can't let us smell the scent of somebody who's just smoked a cigarette or is off their tits on liquor. It can't let us hear all the super fine details of grains of sand scraping under someone's boot after they come in from outside. It's all of these things in a gameplay form that tries to mesh well with how the game operates. Another change that seems to be divisive is the inclusion of a weaponsmithing system. It's less like loadouts from previous games and more like a really slimmed down pick 10 system from Call of Duty. You make changes in between levels, but can also make changes in game at workbenches scattered throughout the level to help you change your loadout. Probably my favorite inclusion is someone who likes multiplayer but hates having to actually interact with other humans. Axis Invasion allows you to have other players invade your campaign as a sniper Jaeger, or you can invade other people's games. It brought a new series of skills and mechanics to the game, and was generally the most well-received of all the new features. If you played Axis Invasion when it first came out, it's apparently been heavily updated and modified from how it played at launch, so if you have a different experience than I did, that's likely why, as I'm essentially playing this exactly a year after launch. Rolling on into the rest of the multiplayer, while reviewing the whole series, I've been promising for a more in-depth look at the multiplayer. I finally get to the most recent entry, which is barely a year old, and finding multiplayer matches, while not impossible, definitely isn't easy. 
Axe's Invasion is by far the worst offender. Like, I had to change my region multiple times to try to find a match. But for a game mode that you have to go out of your way to turn off, that's pretty rough. But for the multiplayer modes, I did get to play. Holy shit, is it not for me. There seems to be no divide between the sniper duels. It's either twitchy as fuck or extremely subdued. Like if fly fishing and golf had a really violent baby. Team deathmatch was deeply unpleasant. The experienced players knowing exactly where to camp gave me PTSD flashbacks to Halo 2's Jackal Snipers. The other mode I played was called No Cross and is a fairly cool idea on paper. You're on a large map, and both teams are separated by an impassable no-man's land. There's still lots of camping, duh. But in this case, because there's so much area to hide in, it doesn't feel like you've always got a target on your back. It just gets boring. After a while, people get too scared to move, and then you realize there's still five minutes on the clock. I don't feel the need to go over survival and co-op again. I already did in my review for SE4, and they're essentially the same thing. I'm really sorry to anybody who wanted me to dig deeper into the multiplayer. If you feel strongly about it, you got one more video on this game coming from me, so let me know in the comments. But there just isn't much for me to talk about. I just have a general distaste for this form of PvP. Although one P I do have a taste for is the presentation. Sniper Elite 5, as you'll see, has a lot of issues, but the music is not one of them. The soundtrack experience has always been great for this series, and the music follows the general guidelines of 80% recognizably Sniper Elite and a 20% flourish of music reminiscent of the location we're visiting. And SE5 nails this, potentially better than any of the games previously. The soundtrack makes great use of horns and strings to capture a very foreboding atmosphere, almost like it's trying to warn you. Any soaring highs always contain a bit of danger and melancholy, like the track's secret weapons. grinding, gothic, and haunting. Like my personal favorite, War Factory. lies something that's playful and twisted like in the track for the game like in the track for the game's opening level Atlantic Wall Elite 5 has voice acting, and this time around it's much, much better. But the way it's mixed with the rest of the game audio is so weird. During cutscenes, it sounds like whoever's talking is whispering directly into your ear, even when they're on the other even when they're on the other side of the room. Charlie? Thanks. I just needed a distraction. Actually, on the subject of the voice acting, this is probably a good lead into the visuals because the facial animations are super odd to me. I don't know if it's just their mouths are moving, but the lips look like they're not, or the expression in the eyes isn't quite matching what they're saying, but it's unsettling. Besides that, visuals are once again the best we've had in the series. Environments, character models, you name it, it's gotten some sort of an upgrade. The setting of Brittany really, it does its best to sell the story, but each location focuses in on a specific environment that represents some key moments of the Allied invasion of France. Which is where we find our Carl this go around. Like a World War II Forrest Gump, he's found himself in another critical juncture of the war, D-Day. Or rather, just before D-Day. Yeah, if you looked at this promo image of the game and thought you might be storming the beaches with Carl, don't get your hopes up because it doesn't happen. Instead, we find ourselves attached to a group of army rangers on board a stupidly easy to see submarine. This will possibly be important later. Before I get into the mission by mission analysis, I need you to understand that if my retelling of the story seems inconsistent, it's not. In a series where the story is always in quotation marks, there's really a bare minimum that's hard to hit, yet SE5 just scrapes on by. Our 
Our first mission is the Atlantic Wall, and I think in this single mission I can point out everything that bugged me about SE5. To say this game starts off on the wrong foot is an understatement. Honestly, I wonder how many people started SE5, realized all the bullshit they were slogging through, and just gave up. As mentioned, we start on board a submarine off the coast of France, getting hassled by Jeff Sullivan. Sully doesn't like Carl very much, and throughout this whole scene just sounds perpetually pissed off. Fair enough, but this is the opening level, Jeff. Give the nice folks a minute to breathe. After taking out the searchlights, we motor to shore on Tutorial Island. I know it's not an island, but I'm gonna call it an island because I know it just bugs the shit out of you. Now right off the bat, I'm reminded of the first Sniper Elite, and that won't be the first time you hear me say this in this video. I'm reminded by the ambience and overall destruction we can see in the skies and here in the distance. Previously, games have had impressive soundscapes, but here we feel like a very small cog in the massive military machine that is Operation Overlord. Bombers and flak are lighting up the sky, we hear air raid sirens and distant firefights. Not unlike the first game where we're treated to an ambience of total destruction, which kind of sounds like the title of a Megadeth album. The only thing missing from both of them is the occasional woman screaming in the background. And if you couldn't tell, the objectives in this mission are going to revolve around helping out the Flyboys. But let's be real. It's sniper elite. This could be taking place on a lovely summer afternoon on a random Tuesday, and we would still find some excuse to blow up some German artillery. We go through the usual tutorial island fare, run, jump, crawl, craniectomy, when finally we stumble upon an outpost where a French resistance member is being held. Here is where one of the first big issues with SE5 crops up. See the size of this encounter? You get far more of these than you do of these. Small to medium sized engagements, three to five enemies, where those eight and 12x zoom scopes are going to be completely wasted. I think this is why you see the sentiment so much around this game that you, quote, don't snipe in a game called Sniper Elite. I mean, sure, you are sniping here, but you don't get those massive elevated sight lines like you did in previous games. Just these short stretches a few dozen meters away from where you'll be sprinting in a few seconds anyway. We take out the guards and meet one of the main side characters, Charlie. Her voice actor is great, but the facial animation leaves a bit to be desired. She has that weird pursed lip like everybody else does, but her eyes look glassy as fuck. She either just took a massive bong rip or she's about to burst into tears. After splitting up with Charlie, we get introduced to our next mechanic, the ability to sense enemies nearby. This might turn some people off, there's some reasons why it can be a little OP, which I'll get into later, but to be honest, I like this mechanic. It gives me that temporary sixth sense that allows me to see what enemies are doing behind certain walls. It's a gameplay mechanic that allows me to have more fun. The next room we go into is the armory, where we find the next addition to SE5, different ammo types. And I hear you cry, but Greg, we've had different ammo types before, to which I'll say yes, but not like this. Before we basically had regular, chocolate, silent, and then AP rounds for dealing with vehicles. Now we have six, regular, subsonic, match, soft point, armor piercing, and non-lethal. Regular is exactly what it sounds like, normal ass FMJ rounds. Next is Subsonic, which offers even less penetrating power than you did in high school, but they're significantly quieter. Then there's Match, these offer less bullet drop and are better for sniping over longer distances. We have Soft Point, which do more damage to unarmored opponents. Armor piercing rounds are to help you deal with vehicles, and non-lethal rounds are for fueling angry game journalists. For each class of weapon, you can take up to two extra ammo types. It was nice to be able to use some weapons like the sidearm and secondaries with a bit more stopping power by removing the suppressor and using subsonic, though I will say results may vary. Weapon stats are important people, which we'll actually see in just a second. See in SE5 we get the return of a familiar sight, temporary weapons, only shittier. Yeah, remember in previous games when you'd find a Panzerfaust or MG42 and think, I'm gonna hold on to this until I need it? Yeah, that won't happen unless you keep it as your active weapon, because as soon as you switch to another, you're gonna drop that shit. Have fun lugging those weapons halfway across the map just to get any use out of them. To be honest though, what might make me even more sour is how we interact with them. Remember how before we had the option to replace weapons or just pick up the ammo? Well, now you can only pick up the weapon, and taking the ammo out of it can only be done with the perk that you unlock later. And to pick up the weapon, we use the same interact key as we do for everything else. Infuriating. Like here, I pick up a different rifle without realizing it because my attention tends to be drawn elsewhere, and that barely off-white coloring on the bottom of the screen doesn't shout, this is a temp weapon. Anyway, even though this rifle was suppressed, it was not loaded with subsonic. So when I get set up to execute the plan I'd worked out, 
I ended up alerting everybody to my location because I was shooting with a gun I didn't expect. I'm entirely open to the possibility that it's just me, and these are issues someone who pays closer attention won't have, but fighting with the UI isn't on the top of my to-do list, especially if I haven't had to before. Anyway, before we leave the armory, it's worth mentioning that the workbenches which you find scattered throughout the world, I'm in favor of them. I like being able to adapt on the fly and swap out a piece of kit that isn't working. I feel less like I need to commit to any one weapon, especially newer unlocks, for the entire mission. It definitely resulted in me trying more of them out. Alright, that was a bit of a mouthful, let's jump back to the game. Leaving the more hand-holy tutorial island for the cold and unforgiving landscape of World War II Brittany, we see what at first looks like a nice, sweeping landscape. But it's not. This is just a little bit bigger than the encounter I mentioned earlier. There's only four guys, and two of them are in a vehicle. But look at Sniper Elite 4. Look at the view we get when leaving that game's tutorial island. It's massive. I'm slowly building a case against the design of these maps. This won't be the last time I mention this. Now that we can make our own calls and how we complete our objectives, we've got a few options to choose from. However, some won't unlock unless you visit certain places of interest, gather intel, or visually spot the threat. Map-wise, we see the same trend of having firm locations as well as general areas that we're required to search to find the object, usually a target or something we need to blow up, but they do something that, in Sniper Elite 5, really pisses me off. The identifier pointing out what the actual objective is, it's a taggable objective on the map. Yeah, you can see there's a big circle around it, but the map also shows you individual objectives in the same style, also within the bounds of the area you gotta search, and those are also taggable. Normally in other games, I would get to the location, realize I did a whoopsie, and just keep on hunting through the area. But SE5 stopped me from doing this because the environments are awful. Not visually. Visually, they're stunning. And extremely interested to look at. Look being the operative word, because it's what you can't see that's getting ready to bite you in the dick. SE5 goes hard on the invisible walls, unpassable hedges, and terrain that looks climbable, but isn't. So on a map like, I don't know, the very first one you experience, if you're a dingle like me, and think there's an objective marker here you have to go to, you're gonna assume there's a route the developer intended for you to take, like there always is, leading you to run all the way around looking for that Goldilocks path. On the story front, the sub we came in on is spotted and destroyed by the Germans, Carl actually looks at this explosion, which I think might be a first for the series. Nazi bastards. Our main objective is to destroy the giant ass radar, which we can do either by destroying the pillar supporting it or destroying the power source. Neither one makes the big guy go boom, so don't get your hopes up. Optional objectives here are a bit more fun in my opinion. There is the series staple, blow up some anti-air guns, of course where you find baby AA emplacements. We know the mother can't be too far away. This mission feels really explosion heavy, which is all the more frustrating now that you have to pick up satchel charges you find the map instead of just magically whipping them out of your carl bags and blowing shit up. Oh yeah, I haven't fully explained my beef with the new tool system yet. Satchel charge, crowbar, bolt cutters. One essential and two extremely useful items that you're never going to have on you when you need them. There are generally some workarounds for the cases where you would need those tools. It's not a guarantee. After beating the game on a particular difficulty, you get the satchel charge as an equipable item, but at that point, how much searching is that going to shave off your umpteenth playthrough? You know what? I'm done with this mission. Let's finish it up by exfiltrating all the way over there. This is a common occurrence in this game. Depending on what order you complete objectives in, the exfil site could be right next to you or it could be on the other side of the map. I know a stealth game like this is sort of designed with the idea that you have to successfully get both in and out of the map, but most of the time there's no enemies left and I'm just sprinting to a marker half a kilometer away, listening to Carl's loud ass breathing. <sighs> conditioning Carl. Ever heard of it? While I was going through my second playthrough and making a jog back, I had an idea. What if you can just exfil from anywhere once the mission is done? I know, I know, you want new players to appreciate the size and scope of your map, but hear me out. What if you put the final workbench, and by extension that weapon unlock, in the safe areas we have to exfil from? Make it so that first time players have to go to those locations, unlock the bench, and then in subsequent playthroughs, make it an entirely skippable affair. I mean, that's basically how the infiltration points work anyway, right? You have to go to the area and literally open it up for the next playthrough. You don't need to go back and make it accessible for the next time you play. It's one and done. Anyway, entering the safe house, we're greeted by a pissed off French lady. I call her Frenchie. She's such a piss poor excuse of a character, I can't for the life of me remember her name. This is Marie. Thank you, Charlie. So Marie has apparently been helping Charlie out a bunch. She's real hot and bothered for this intel, but more importantly, we see that Marie's defining traits range from being kind of a bitch to having the sort of dead eyes that would make Ted Bundy shiver. Did you get the intel? And knowing the classic sniper leap pacing, we're gonna give it to her and she's gonna fill us in on her tragic backstory. No, Charlie, Charlie, it's not, it's not your turn. There's a weird 
cut here where Charlie brings up the fact that Carl was born and raised in Germany and is a native German speaker. Marie gives this kind of, wait what? And then Carl hits her with one of the most brooding Carl for Carl's sake one-liners. I chose my side. It kind of makes me think that there might have been extra dialogue in there that would give this story some substance. It's not the first time this happens, and I'm gonna hit you with a bit of a spoiler. The substance never comes. This story sucks. In between missions, we get wrap-ups from the SOE HQ lady, who seemingly is the only reoccurring character besides Carl, and I think these wrap-ups are because Rebellion knew people were gonna be skipping through the cutscenes, and they needed to have some way to communicate what's going on to the sort of players that just mash continue whenever a text box comes up. You know who you are. I guess it's cool, because each one ends with an intercepted transmission from the big baddie Muller, but it's hard for me to see it as anything other than an excuse to learn more about the villain in a format that's cheap to produce, so it seems like he's more fleshed out. I don't know, I don't like being such a jaded prick, but SE5's got me feeling away, man. Oh, and Sullivan survived the sub getting blown up. That'll come up in a completely unimportant way later. On to occupied residence. And we roll up to Muller's estate after what was likely one of the most emotionally frigid road trips ever. Can you imagine being stuck in a car with these two? That aux cord wasn't even glanced at. The two disembark and Maria's like, oh, by the way, Muller isn't here, which is a massive waste of time. Maybe that would have been a good topic for the drive. Charlie tells me that in Italy you are known as the shadow. Ah, uh, remember? Sniper Elite 4? The last time a chilly European broad tasked you with a surprise challenge in the middle of the woods? You were having fun then. You're having fun now, right? Local Resistance gives us some info, and we're on our way. I do kind of miss those save zones from the previous games we started each mission with. It gave us a chance to interact with more of the main cast, and if one were so inclined, to discover more of the story. But you could also just breeze past all the NPCs if you didn't care. To get to Muller's estate, you have three possible routes to take. The other two are pretty stacked, so I take the path that leads me through the woods, away from too many guards. Initially, we get a decent mid-range sniping area with some guards, and easy environmental kills, but as we wind through the path, we get to a barn with some rifle ammo and a generator to mask our shots. You know what that means, and I like where this is going. What the fuck? What is this tree doing here? It's splitting the TSA in half. Oh, that's a total snipable area. And it gave us the shitty halves. If this tree wasn't in the way, I'd have a perfect shot right through to the fence line. But instead I get, what, the MG nest? Some crates? And they don't even blow up? If this were the 2006 international cinematic phenomenon, Crank, and I was Jason Satham, I'd be dead right now. And you can't tell me this is to evoke the real life scenario of needing to fire and move, or that no one vantage point is gonna be perfect because I started on the ground. I had to go out of my way to get up to that window, not the other way around. Luckily, I picked up a key to some old tunnels under the estate that allows me to sneak in undetected, my preferred home invasion method. Entering the cellar, we find a lightly guarded armory with a bunch of Panzerfausts I can't wait to not use, and then the main courtyard, which is guarded enough that you won't be fucking around if you wanna keep things quiet. Inside, we find an appropriately ornate array of hallways, suits of armor, and super uncomfortable looking chairs. Which means if you didn't know, this is a rich person's house. Muller's office is locked, and wanting to take this a bit quieter, and because I didn't have one, I opt to not satchel charge the door and go looking for the key instead. The area outside Muller's office is a little crowded, and our secondary target, Kumler, isn't around right now. So I laid some guards to rest in there, out of sight, and set out to find some keys. Oh yeah, secondary targets. I forgot to mention, but besides the optional objectives, every Every mission has a high value target that SOE wants taken out for one reason or another. In this mission, Kumler, Muller's nephew, is the man on my list. We find him drinking out of his uncle's stash in the ballroom, but this Cinderella has a date with the chandelier, and being a bit of a romantic, I just had to bring him together. Breaking into Muller's office, searching for intel, we find the mechanism for a hidden room. We have some allusions to friends in the Japanese, and references to an Operation Kraken. We don't know what it is, but we know who's involved, where they'll be, and when. We hit the road, but not before completing our secondary objective, collecting all the relics Kumler was stealing from the occupied residence. We follow a trail of letters, which eventually lead us to a courtyard sniper, who's helping his brother steal the artifacts from Kumler. We meet back up with the Resistance, and hit the road for Beaumont Saint-Denis. In between missions, we catch up with Muller, who finds finds out his pad's been ransacked, and watch him interrogate a member of the resistance. All the bullshit about needing someone who's quiet goes out the window as the saboteur immediately tells Muller about Carl, calling him the Shadow. In a shocking act of continuity, Muller is scared shitless because the sniper who took out the rat and the razor missiles is in France. Carl's reputation precedes him, finally. We leave Muller in a fade to black, finally understanding what it means to suffer from success. 
And next, we have Spy Academy. The level people point to when you say Sniper Elite 5 doesn't have any sniping. And when you first turn the corner, I mean, wow. We're almost overwhelmed by how much there is to see. There's scope glint of enemy snipers, a motorcycle patrolling the beach. Every time you open your binoculars, there's something else to see. And we do actually benefit from simply sitting our ass down and waiting, observing to see who's going to walk around what corner or where a supply truck is going. And the whole time, you're just blown away by the monolith that's before you. When Rebellion talks about Sniper Elite taking advantage of modern hardware, this is the example that backs it up. And for the most part, they're right. But there's only so much sniping you can do from right here. As soon as you cross the bridge or the beachfront, you're right back into the medium to close quarters areas I've been talking about. In this particular case, that's just my reasoning for why I don't think this is the level to lean on when talking about sniping in this game. I don't hate it by any means, it just doesn't have the consistency all the way through to back up that claim in my opinion. Our main task is to discover where the meeting between the Kraken bigwigs are and eavesdrop on it. But I want to come back to this in favor of the side objective, disrupt the spy training. Now going into that, you might be thinking, okay, probably going to be a few standard enemies wearing plain clothes or something, but it's so much more than that. You step through the door and these fuckers were running lines in makeshift American sets. The enemies we have to mow down are whatever, I guess, but the environment we have to fight them in is just a delight. The collectibles here cue us in a little bit more to what was happening, but as much as I enjoy disrupting any form of higher learning, there's a meeting somewhere that I gotta crash. The gathering is being held at the top of the church, which is a very fun romp to get to. Both of my runs, I botched the whole eavesdropping part of our orders and had to resort to retrospective investigation as there was no one alive to interrogate. Fortunately, they were very diligent in keeping minutes, so all I have to do is grab some documents. Oh, uh, the optional assassination target for this level was one of the guys I just mowed down. We motor on out of here while Muller, completely informed of Carl's capabilities as a one-man Nazi superweapon destroying machine, then dares to say the line, Kraken will not be compromised by one man's interference. What a stupid fucking thing to say. Alright, I've been doing this long enough now that I can pick up on some of the subtle undercurrents linking these games together. Even the smallest details shared between entries in this series cannot escape me. So I want you to bear with me when I hit you with this controversial take. Every Sniper Elite needs to have a factory level, and this is Sniper Elite 5's. We get a cutscene laying out the infiltration plan, and oh yeah, Sullivan survived. Too bad. He throws a bitch fit about, I'm not sure. I legitimately don't understand what he's mad about. Like, listen to this. Our mission is complete. We've done our job and paid the price. We have our orders to return to England, and SOE promised to get it done, and I expect you to honor that commitment. Look, I'm sorry about your men, but... But nothing. I was told your outfit was professional, but Fairburn, who, don't forget, is the reason we're stuck here in the first place, waltzes in with weak old intel, and you drop everything to help him, what, chase rumors? So maybe Carl did something in the previous missions that was responsible for getting the sub blown up? I don't know. The way Sullivan phrases his complaints is like, he's waiting on a ride back to England. I'm sure they can manage that. He's a ranger working with SOE. He should know their operatives would be expected to roll with things when they have to. So I just don't know what the problem is. There's no indication that plans have been changed in any way by Sullivan leaving. Actually, yeah, I think it's literally that Sullivan signed on to do the first mission and is pissed off for pursuing our leads. What an asshole. And to make it worse, Frenchie walks by like a piece of cardboard carried by the wind and drops this on us. It's a good job you like working alone, Monsieur Shadow. What a bitch. It doesn't even make any sense. Carl was on the receiving end of everything and is just trying to do his job. The manufactured conflict here needs to go back to the factory because I ain't buying it right off the bat, I'm going to spoil something for you. Our optional assassination target in this mission is a simple grunt who has stopped feeding us good information, thinking himself something of a double agent. So the SOE, these absolute geniuses, decide that the one habit this guy has that we're going to exploit is that he likes to shoot rats. So this rat, stuffed with a bomb, is meant to be used with the assumption that this guy is going to see it, shoot at it, and be close enough to be killed by the explosion. Now, I need to stress I'm not mad that this plan requires so many assumptions on the part of the SOE that it's in the realm of fiction. I'm mad because the rat bomb was real and they fucked it up. The Allies figured the German war machine was going so hard that somebody shoveling coal or whatever into a furnace wasn't going to stop if he found a dead rat in the pile. He'd just toss it in. The idea is this would not only damage furnaces and factories, but anywhere else coal was being used. When the Germans intercepted a shipment of rats that had been slid open like a tauntaun and stuffed with a Luke Skywalker-sized amount 
of plastic explosives. It caused such a freak out that the Allies decided the plan had already been more successful than if they had actually went through with the plan and left it at that. So back to War Factory. You want to know what our main mission is? Nothing crazy, just uh render a blast furnace inoperable. How do we do that? We turn some valves, like in every other game. We even get to see some guards shoveling material into the furnace, where we could so easily drop a rat bomb in and watch the show. I'll admit, the rat bomb wasn't developed with the intention of destroying this type of furnace, but I can suspend my disbelief at that a hell of a lot more than I can at us leaving one where our specific target in a giant factory complex might see it. Aside from that though, this is a great mission. The music for this level slaps particularly hard. The variety of areas we get to see and work through is immense, but what really made this level something special for me is that it was the first time I experienced an Axis invasion. The experience I had here honestly has to be the absolute best case scenario Rebellion intended for this mode, and I gotta say it was awesome. Most of the missions took me like an hour, hour and a half to beat, but War Factory took me almost three hours to complete because me and a total stranger were just playing cat and mouse. I'd slink through the shadows, avoiding patrols while my eyes flicked from rooftop to every darkened corner, wondering where I'd find this guy. In one instance, I figured out where he was, but our exchange of gunfire brought in some unwanted guests. The AI that had seemed trivial just moments earlier began closing in while he took pot shots from his position in the Texas School Book Depository. That ended for me as it historically does. My only problem with this game mode is it needs to be expanded upon. At this point, I'd almost call it life support. Maybe with some bots or something? When I went to play it as the Sniper Jaeger, finding games took forever, even with me region hopping trying to find a game. I think at least with bots, you could spice up the gameplay in a truly solo run, but more importantly, when it's a year past launch and nobody wants to play it anymore. As mentioned earlier in this video, there seems to have been some changes made to how Axis Invasion works now compared to at launch. When I played, it worked like this. As the Jaeger, you can create a little network of rats by tagging your fellow soldiers. By doing this, you'd be able to see their alertness level, and by running through a map tagging guys, you could more easily pinpoint where your target might be based on who's being alerted to it or not. As Carl, you have all the usual tactics at your disposal, except your little spidey sense thing becomes massively OP, allowing you to see through walls, whereas the Jaeger can't. This means once you track him to a general area, which all of the other mechanics do fairly easily, you can just turn that on to find out where he's hiding. Of course, you can just not use this, but there's no guarantee your opponents won't either. The other mechanic is the phones. Carl calls in with a variety of excuses asking where the Jaeger is, which will give you his current location. If you do this too many times in a row, then your location will be shared with the Jaeger. As the Jaeger, you also have access to these phones, but the cooldown on them is much longer, and they reveal your location to the enemy anyway. There are some other small quality of life things I appreciated in this mode. For one, if you spend too long in one specific area, then you'll eventually get kicked for camping. You could make the argument that a real sniper would sit and wait for ages, but I think for a dynamic game mode like this, you do need someone to come over and shake the tin to keep things moving. Once my frenemy had rage quit, it was back to Geonosis to destroy the refinery and exfil like nothing ever happened. The facility is exploding behind us. Not sure what we did to cause that, because we sure as shit didn't use any explosives. For the end of level lore dump, they say that Carl has, quote, gone rogue, and that the US wants him recalled immediately. For what? He's clearly been successful. Just look at Muller yelling at his himbo and jackboots about how he can't believe the single ally soldier he knows by name for destroying several other Nazi secret projects managed to worm his way in and destroy his secret Nazi project. Oh yeah, and don't think I missed that bit about foreign colleagues. I see you Sniper Leap 5, you got some kind of big payoff coming, right? Yeah, I bet you do. Alright, Guernsey, or as I like to call it, the better choice for the opening level. As I went back through footage writing this script, I realized that I had far less to say about this level initially than the other ones because I had far less to complain about. As a Sniper Elite fan, when everything's going well, my brain just kind of shuts off and I enjoy the sandbox provided for me. It's remarkably atmospheric, like the soundtrack, it's been doing some heavy lifting, and here I don't necessarily notice the moments it's missing because the audio design just feels so cohesive with the rest of the level. All the important bits of presentation come together in a really seamless way. When it comes time to massacre an entire garrison, I first have to break out my notebook and start my checklist of everything in this mission that is, as the kids say, 
bussin. Right off the bat, we reaffirm what everybody already knows, that staking out the area and stalking full-grown men can be quite rewarding. We find out that the Nazis are holding off and repairing the cables, securing the radio tower because they got company, and don't want it to let slip that anything could possibly be wrong, meaning there's just two brittle cables keeping it up. Just gonna take this guy out with one well-placed shot. Nailed it. This mission is pretty stacked. Sabotaging the radio tower is just the start. We have a kill target that we have to bury in concrete somehow, not to mention our main goal of tracing the shipment that was sent here from the factory before we could stop it. Before we get down to business though, let's soak in the sights. I got myself up to a vantage point and have some great views into everyone's business on this side of the island. Climbing this big ass tower gives me the best sight lines in the game, but more notably, the best sight lines up the ass of this tank. While I don't love how they've been implemented so far in this game, the one kudos I can give is that these fuckers still go boom. Actually, this might be the best example of knowing when Sniper Elite is operating on all cylinders. With my superior position on the high ground and the right ammo for the job, I feel completely in control of this situation. Maybe you might see some less than our pathfinding on the part of the AI, but I see a tank crew scrambling to sight me after hearing my shots ping off the sides of their soon-to-be coffin. All I need to be successful in this counter is patience, choosing well-placed shots, and staying out of sight. Notice how I didn't say zip lines in that list even once? Yeah, they're handy sometimes, but with the way they're tossed in with the marketing, you'd think they just 3D scan Hitler's nuts to make their digital counterparts as accurate as possible. Oh, look at this! Zipline. Of course, these are the guys that also make it look like you'd be storming the beaches of Normandy literally on the front of the game, when the closest you get to that is Sullivan's fugly ass yelling at you, and something coming up in the next mission that's equally as mid. Inching closer to the underground hospital, we come across another detail I enjoy, which is these propaganda announcements playing ad nauseum. People are the Allied invasion of France will never happen, and the cowardly politicians in London are already begging for peace. I don't know who this is for, as every house I enter is abandoned, but if there were people hiding, I bet it's soul crushing. And speaking of hiding, here's another Japanese flag. I see you, Sniper Elite. Can't wait to see that payoff. And in the category of things you won't be hearing me say much in this video, we haven't even gotten down the road before stumbling upon another great encounter. Yes, I would rank this more along the lines of the medium-sized ones I was bitching about like an hour ago, but this one gets a pass because there's so much to unpack at a glance. After clearing a building clearly just built to make Axe's invasion more interesting, we find the entrance to the underground hospital and those esteemed guests mentioned by the soldiers earlier. But first, an explanation of what Project Kraken actually is. And for once, I'm glad it's not some extravagant super weapon. They're simply rubber plates that allow a submarine to stay invisible on radar. They mention these plates can be easily retrofitted onto older submersibles and that no radar equipment they've tested on the prototypes, Allied or Axis, showed the boats. I'm a really big fan of this as the big bad plot because it's nefarious in its simplicity. Untraceable U-boat wolf pack stalking the Atlantic is a terrifying prospect. Would it have been an instant win for the Axis? No. But it would have been a significant leg up on the Allies. Anyway, as the secret meeting we're spying on comes to a close, we hear a surprising name, Nakamura. Now, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that might not be German. Not that I'm planning on sticking around long enough to find out. Our next task is to destroy the prototypes, and we have a few ways of doing it. We can overload some valves, drop some bombs on the fuel lines, or my personal favorite, calling in a scuttle code. Scuttling on out of there, the facility comes down on top of the U-boats, but before we can exfil, a little birdie told me that someone on this island has a date with some concrete. The way you actually achieve this is dead simple, but it made me feel so stupid. Basically, you just start pouring some concrete into a foundation, crack the railing above it, knock Bowman out, and toss his body in there. Fuck me, he cleared it. Of course, I spent like half my runtime kiting him around the map, trying to trick him into walking up to the railing, trying to knock him over. Pretty much anything except the most obvious answer. I have no one to blame but myself. Leaving the exfil, we have a run-in with a tank. I just ran around it because I was lazy. Oh, I also destroyed a battery at some point in there. To be honest, it's such a nothing task at this point. I just block it out most of the time. And to be honest, I can't be fucked to go back and figure out where I did it. So just know that it happened. For our end of mission intel drop, it's confirmed that yes, SOE acknowledges how serious of a threat this is and that Carl was right to pursue it. Not in those exact words, but I'm filling in between the lines because who else is going to do that for you? We then listen in on Muller, who's both pissed off their facility got exploded and embarrassed 
Paris that their Japanese allies came all this way to watch them get owned by the one man known for destroying Nazi superweapons. To be honest, Muller, I think Japan in 1944 has some more serious problems than wasting a trip to France. Okay, remember how I promised you we would get to see Carl get in on some of that D-Day action? Well, here it is. We see some more Rangers while we fly in a glider for deployment. At first, I like that the pilot had what sounds like a Scottish accent. Hang on, boys! This is it! Because I thought this was going to be a more unique group of soldiers. Sure, he's wearing American gear, but maybe it's all part of some SOE plan that we haven't learned about yet. And they're dead. Running through the forest, we get a series of assignments from guys just standing there with their backs to the front. First, we find that there's an armored car overlooking the river. Next, we have to take out their communications. And finally, they let us know there's a sniper taking pot shots at the rangers, acting like he's some kind of sniper elite or something. And you know what? Making my way further into the village, this isn't such a bad level for sniping. We're finally tasked with some counter sniping. And while the scope glint is very telling, we still have to keep our eyes peeled among the rubble. You'll never climb super high, but your sight lines are quite far compared to the other levels. Plus, there's loads of bad guys to shoot right in the opening of the level like this one guy who was seemingly stuck in time because I shot a mid-animation. Hard cut to me getting spotted by the 222 and about to be swarmed by a bunch of blondies, but there's a little trick I have yet to reveal to you, fine viewer, and that's that a well-placed explosive can solve pretty much any problem. Getting swarmed by Germans? Well-placed grenade. 222 got you down? Well-placed TNT. Boring kid's birthday party? After performing some IT support, the comms have been taken out, the armored car was destroyed, I guess there is a tank. Speaking of tanks, we got one barred up on the second floor of this house by the name of Jan Troutman. He's scheduled to die. If he gets alerted to your presence, he locks himself away behind the doors along with your unique kill opportunity. So the trick is to load up at this level start, be very, very quiet, and dose the rat with enough warfarin to kill a water buffalo. After reloading my save 400 times to get that footage, I've made my way over to a ruined house overlooking the bridge with the larger than normal force guarding it. Moving closer to finish the job felt really good. I could tactically take them apart the way I wanted to. Finally, getting to the bridge, we find an ass load of explosives. Uh, as a fun fact, ass load is the unit of weight used by the Allied powers until the end of the war. The more you know. Finally, we investigate the bridge into town and find it barricaded and surrounded by baddies, take them out, connect the explosives to blow up the barricade, destroy the tank waiting on the other side, and we'll call it a day. Wrapping up the level, we get some more dead-eyed exposition from Frenchie. Charlie is there, and Sullivan is A-OK -okay with us now. Fair bird. Good hunting. Jeez, Jeff, why don't you just make out with them? Seriously, why don't you, uh... We don't get anything interesting from our check-in with the Legion of Doom, so on to Mission 7. Loading up secret weapons, we watch Carl jump onto a moving train, slide through the mud, and good lord, that sweater just has to reek at this point. How is it even still blue? Cable knit sweaters aside, this is another level where you're given multiple ingress points to choose from. Really, the only reason to go with the heavily defended ones is because you want more of a challenge. There isn't really a reason to do it otherwise. There's nothing enticing you in that direction. You know what? That's a bit of a negative way to start this section. I actually really enjoyed this level. We've got enemy armor cruising the roads, snipers hidden away in bushes, and of course, V2 rockets to blow up. It feels the most sniper elite-y out of all the missions so far. Kind of annoying that the levels get better as they go on. I wonder how many people stopped playing right before things started to get good. Either way, to start, I decided to go check out the point of interest outside the perimeter of the dome, where I stumble upon two points of intrigue, manifest and a mystery. The manifest lays out the production process for all sorts of weapons passing through here, not just Kraken. We take some recon photos of the different tanks and armaments and move on to raid some of the weapons labs further on in the complex. The mystery is more of a workplace drama. Being the absolute nosy bitch that I am, all of my surveillance targets have been talking about this guy named Jungers, who actually turns out to be our target for this mission. He's the self-important scientist responsible for developing new weapons, and when he comes around, things slow to a crawl around the site, both to keep up appearances and jump at Jungers every whim, guard posts, and even the materials offloading crews are understaffed, and people fucking hate him for that. The entire plot of this level couldn't give a shit now. I'm thirsty for more of this tea and to meet the man himself. Catching up with him, he sure is a prick. He's clearly a gifted scientist, but has a major superiority complex when it comes to the rank and file. This footage might look like I'm searching through the weapons lab, but I need to assure you my goal was centered squarely on how to take this guy out in the most extra way possible. And after reloading my save a bunch of times and trying to lure Jungers under the rocket, I opted for the approach I employed earlier. Knock him out, lay him where I want him, and kill him with the rocket. Nailed it.
So wrapping up all the weapons lab data, we find out the Germans are planning the construction of their V2s to be viable under a variety of circumstances. Retreat, compromised and limited supply lines, etc. They're also working on some experimental tank weapons. I like that this weapons lab isn't just focused on Kraken. It shows that the Germans have just about as much faith in Kraken as they do all the other harebrained schemes. Churn out quantity and worry about quality later. With that task out of the way, we've got one more pit stop before we roll up on the dome. Carl smells another V2 somewhere else on the island and can't not help himself. Rolling up on the test site, we take out the multitudes of nerds guarding it, sabotage the gyros, and realize that this fellow was trained on Normandy, suggesting it was Muller's plan to bomb everything and everyone on the beaches if it means halting the Allied advance. Concerning, but that worry slowly faded away while we manually launched this rocket. Tracing the fuel lines back to the larger production facility, we also figure out that... <sighs> By turning a few valves, what else? We can overload the fuel line, basically render this facility's V2 production abilities useless. And as promised, we can finally go check out the dome. And while being close quarters, which no doubt has sounded thoroughly demonized in this video, this section is fucking great. The tight corridors make traps way more effective, and I dare say more fun to use. And finally getting up to the main level of the dome, we've got some sniping opportunities, but in just an absolute clusterfuck. There's an armored car, loads of Jaegers, visibility from every goddamn side, it's great. I think maybe this is how SE can do the more up close and personal sections without them feeling too linear. Just stick us in these impossible scenarios where we have to chip away at defenses in order to be successful. But even if you hated this section, it's okay. Because once we find the war room with all the juicy deets, Carl has some very Carl moments. First of all, Kraken isn't launching from this site, which I figured was obvious, it's launching from San Nazaire, but there'll soon be an entire fleet of U-boats invisible to Allied radar tech crossing the Atlantic, carrying V2s destined for Washington and New York. Not good, but just as Carl is about to leave, he hears a phone ring and can't resist. I feel like we've done this before. Klimt, I'm afraid Herr Klimt isn't available right now. Can I take a message? Who is that? Who do you think it is, Muller? Of course, it's now time to exfil, but... Carl, see, he's got a problem with V2s. And not just the men, but the women and the children too. Which means if there's one more left unexploded on this base, that's mission failure for him. Take out the boat patrolling the lake, shoot the service panel causing the capsule to close, launch the rocket, and it's easy as that. We exfil, jump in Frenchie's truck, and back on the road we go. Our penultimate mission is Rebel and Ruin, and it opens with the questionable phrase, Moeller has been two steps ahead of us this entire time. I guess so? He struck me as more of a bumbling moron called up to the major leagues from a nursing home, but sure, I guess he did have that hidden room which took us no time at all to discover. Be honest, the only way I think he steps ahead of us is because he simply started first. In a very short amount of time, Carl's leveled the playing field enough that he's running out of shoes that are required to drop. But I guess because the German are getting ready to send Kraken to hit America, we're gonna assume Muller's cutthroat planning is what's to think. Alright, I'll quit being an asshole for a bit, because what we find in the bombed out ruin of San Nazaire is the closest we've gotten to a Sniper Elite V2 level in ages. Let's see, air raid sirens, punctuated by the occasional scream, check. Rolling packs of Nazis to contend with, check. A church we can have a shootout in? Well, I'm sure you know the answer to that one. This mission can really be separated into different main hub areas where certain objectives take place, and the first one here is as close to shooting fish in a barrel as you could ask for. After taking out the goon squad and taking a conveniently placed zipline, we come across just the most orally hidden resistance safe house I've ever seen. You climb like two levels, take a right, and there's just a big old French flag flying, all the lights are on, feet are kicked up, World Cup turned to deaf senior levels, and there's nary a weapon in sight, as you were. Entering the wider world of this tiny ass map, we encounter more of what I like. Visual clutter, distractions, hidden snipers, all the things that say to a Neanderthal like me to stop, slow down, and observe. Coming up on our first objective, knocking out communications equipment, is when I start to realize the real challenge in a setup like this. You have your sixth sense, but you'll never catch everyone. You have some good lookout positions, but you will, you'll always miss somebody. Every enemy has someone else looking out for them, and you've just got to dismantle this bomb like an onion. Peel it back one layer at a time until it's diffused. You know, a classic onion bomb, just like your mom always taught you. Had I jumped right from V2 to this game, I wouldn't have batted an eye because that game trained me to think like that. But going from larger maps to these more claustrophobic ones shows me that that tactical close quarters gameplay can exist alongside kilometer long trick shots 
bots and still require you to use similar problem solving for both. What I don't like is this pussyfooting between the two and ultimately satisfying no one. Like partway through, you can climb the church to find an awesome sniper's nest that opens up the map and the enemy armor to your shots. You're looking down on the rat maze with total situational awareness. If only more than like a third of the levels had moments like this. Finally, coming up on the blown out sewers and after pulling Shawshank in the wrong direction, we find ourselves within the facility on a new map. The intersection is fine. For all the grandstanding I've been doing about the sniping in this game, I find myself somewhat split on sections like this because it's a hallway. Like, I know we're inside a massive complex, but it's a hallway. Anyway, we're given our final objective after sneaking in, destroy all three of the Kraken U-boats using all the tricks Sniper Elite can provide. Shoot the thing to drop the thing, turn a valve, then turn another valve, and of course making the risky final shot to make the thing go boom. Wrapping things up with the obligatory happy ending cutscene, we see the Rangers liberating San Nazaire. Sullivan comes in like, Carl, I understand you now because I had family in Washington and you saved their lives. Love that that's how we've capped off the big interpersonal drama. It started out of nowhere and ended providing nothing. But of course, the bad guy is still alive and just so happens to be back at the chateau we designed earlier. I mean, uh, infiltrated, the one we infiltrated earlier. This isn't some kind of asset flip, guys. Charlie delivers the news to Carl that Muller is alive, Frenchie pulls up in her big dumb truck, and off they go. Oh, also, the game reminds us that the Japanese were in on it. Yeah, the last high-value target you have to take out is a high-ranking member of the Japanese Navy. Look, they've made an appearance. Now we get to say they're in the game. Anyway, we're at the Chateau. Charlie and Frenchie go, Oh no, how will you ever make this shot? I have reservations about doing that voice again. Carl makes the shot because it's fucking Carl. Old Dead Eyes sets up for the home run into V2. Roll credits. Look, I put as much effort into covering this level as Rebellion did in designing it. I think when the Game of the Year Deluxe Super Rare Ultra Edition comes out and you get to play this game plus the DLC for $5, people will think of SE5 differently, but for what it launched as, there doesn't feel to be much here. That's partly why I wanted to wait to cover the DLC in its own video. But with the campaign out of the way, I'm sure you're dying to know just what is wrong with Sniper Elite 5. I did two runs, one on normal, then one on hard that was more completionist. Experiencing this game twice in such a short amount of time and between two difficulties really helped me identify what arguments I'm hearing from people that I think hold weight and divorcing them from the arguments that don't. Therefore, this section shall be known as what is and is not wrong with Sniper Elite 5. What happened to sniping? Sightlines exist, but you're quickly corralled into smaller areas. The maps certainly aren't bad, it just feels like in the next evolution of Sniper Elite, I'd like to see the hardware put to better use, expanding the sandbox instead of putting up more walls. Close quarters gameplay is great if you enjoy that sort of thing. Some people don't come here for that, which I get. But a taste of sweeping vistas is just a single step towards the greater vision of Sniper Elite I think fans have for the franchise. Non-lethal. Non-lethal kills are fine. It's another way to play. It puts more constraints and challenge on players who want to tailor their runs in certain ways, and it's not something you need to go out of your way to experience. You also don't have to go out of your way to avoid it either. Unlike <laughs> invisible walls and unpassable terrain. I think of all the items on this list, this might be the only one I consider to be glaring. I was gonna call it unforgivable. See, in the other Sniper Elite games, I never once thought about or criticized invisible walls and barriers, either because they were so invisible I never encountered them, or I didn't go out of my way to find them. In SE5, I didn't start the game intending to criticize them. They're everywhere. They're borderline unavoidable, and I think if you were to ask most gamers, not just Sniper Elite fans, but literally any gamer, if they'd rather a large map cut with impassable terrain or a smaller map that is entirely part of the sandbox, I would guess most people fall into the latter. On the other side of all this, if we were to ask what the trade-off for that would be, well, we know it's to have larger maps, but these are, maps are not larger in a way that a game called Sniper Elite should be taking advantage of. They're just larger. Temporary weapons, tools, and unique kills. I've grouped the smaller sandbox changes into one as a miscellaneous option, but also because they all swing the pendulum back and forth over the line separating absolute garbage fires from, I guess, garbage that is not on fire. They definitely fucked up the temporary weapon systems. Like, I, I'm not sure how or why they did this, but the way it currently is encourages zero weapon strategy or retention. Maybe it's just me and everyone else is fine with running back to the location they remember a Panzerfaust or anti-tank weapon being, but that's not me. And I don't recall having to do that before. 
Maybe in a play test they found people were just carrying them right through to the end because there's not nearly enough vehicles that would require a powerful weapon to destroy, but I think this needs to be changed in the sequel, no questions asked. The tools I'm split on. Actually no, tools like crowbars and stuff I'm fine with, but satchel charges, that's the sticking point. Don't make me hunt for those. Make that the default and make me hunt for the more elaborate kills and sabotage methods. You could kind of see them flirting with this, with the unique kills requiring you to pick up certain items, but to return to the sentiment I, I see used a lot, they're copying Hitman, but they're copying the wrong things. In Hitman, there's always the simplest solution, which lays itself out naturally in front of you without much effort. Then there's the batshit insane stuff that you need to go out of your way to uncover, and the payoff is delightful. What Rebellion is doing is making us hunt for tools, but the payoff is not spectacular. The only difference between SE4 and SE5 in this regard is that in SE4 you would set a satchel charge and proceed to the next objective. In SE5, you go out to set a satchel charge, remember you forgot to pick one up, spend 5 or 10 minutes looking for it, potentially being caught and fucking up your run, and running back just to proceed to the next objective. The challenge can't increase if the reward stays exactly the same. I do that working a 9 to 5. And for the challenge kills, none of the challenge involves any kind of sniping. If you're going to challenge me to kill someone in a game with sniper in the title, I, I mean, you know what I'm going to say. I'm tired of saying it. This was a tough one to write. The story really, really sucks. Even if this is a series where the story was never really a driving force, the gameplay feels like it's losing sight of the franchise's identity and turning into something fans are vocally expressing they're not in favor of. Sure, some of them are screaming louder with worse arguments. I don't think this is nearly the biblical fall from grace for the franchise that everybody says it is, but it is a slide into a sort of identity crisis. Despite that, I still had fun at times. And I'd like to completely acknowledge that I've made a lot of statements that might come across as contradictory in this video, which is partially what took this video so long to write. SE5 has a lot of problems, but when I finished my runs, I was still itching to go back and play more. Some of the aspects frustrate me a bunch, but you can enjoy something that has flaws. You can disagree with choices a developer makes, but still agree with all the choices they made that were right, and celebrate those by losing yourself in their games. We have to stop looking at the games we spend our time playing as some sort of binary equation. Rarely are they all amazing or all horrendous. It's a little of column A, and it's a little of column B. I don't write about games I don't like. When it comes to analyzing a game, you write about the things that are worth writing about, and problems and criticisms naturally start to float to the top because that's where the analysis takes place. At least, I think for me, that's where it flows the most naturally but I think at least most of my criticism contributes something in some way. If someone asks me if they should play Sniper Elite 5, the answer is yes, it's a fine game. I had fun and the good levels towards the end do help to balance the entire product out. But for the capital F fans of the series who have all the context and prerequisites maybe the average gamer doesn't, can see that SE5 does have a trajectory that's worth talking about. Don't worry, I see it too. That's why you have hours of listening to me complain. I would love to see those things fixed. My criticism is not condemnation. This has been an escape from my analog nightmare. Good luck in yours.